Hi all, happy Monday. Welcome to The Wife of Caesar. My name is Michel Levien, or Michel Levien, either is fine. As you know, The Wife of Caesar is Steiner's project to talk about corruption or anti-corruption using everyday words so that we can fight corruption in our day-to-day lives with a little bit more than just good intentions. What is Steiner? Well, Steiner is a bureau. It is an organization that helps other organizations fight corruption inside them. As in every episode, we will have a piece of news, a case, and a typology. Today's news deals with Ireland and Ireland's anti-corruption or anti-bribery law. Now, what happened here? Okay, a little bit of background. We have this international organization called the OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, and it is it has been called the Club of Rich Countries. Okay, so the goal of the OECD is, again, to create and generate better policies so that they can help people improve quality of life, better government, better economics, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, one of the focuses of the OECD is helping fight corruption. They have something called the World Group, no, the Working Group on Bribery. And the purpose of the Working Group on Bribery is to manage a convention, sort of like a contract or an international treaty, but that has many countries. And every member of the OECD has signed this convention and the convention uh, has one purpose, to fight uh, what they call foreign uh, foreign bribery. Foreign bribery is going out of your country and paying bribes somewhere else. Okay. They The, the World Group on Bribery uh, helps countries fight corruption by reviewing their laws and making sure that their laws comply with the standards uh, set forth in the convention. And this is what happened here in Ireland. In Ireland, in 2018, um, the legislative power passed a law uh, that was geared towards fighting corruption, fighting foreign bribery. But the problem with that law is that it, it fails to comply with one of the standards set by the OECD and the convention. Now, the convention, in, in I won't tell you the entire text, but the first article of the convention sa- states that every country has to establish laws that fight foreign bribery and that make it a, make foreign bribery a crime and that that crime has to be autonomous has to be independent of other crimes and other authorities and other findings and other countries so simply put a country cannot say um, that it is a crime to commit a conduct that is a crime in another country because the bureaucratic hurdles that you would have to surpass are, are just huge so they, they the convention forces or uh, commits each country to, to criminalize conduct that is independent from other countries. And this is where the Ireland, the Irish law has its major failings. It, uh, it sets forth that foreign bribery is a crime, that going out of Ireland to pay bribes is a crime, as long as that conduct, conduct is also criminalized in the host country, in the other country, the country where the bribe is paid. And this is a problem because, again, it creates a bureaucratic loophole. We're a bit skeptical about the way this law is drafted because Ireland has been characterized by many people in, on many occasions as a tax haven. Um, a tax haven is a place where you have to pay very little ta- very few taxes, or if any at all. Now, we will talk about this more on, in, when we talk about the typology and we explain what uh, base erosion and profit shifting is. But the the main gist of the news is that Ireland has passed a law that fails to meet Ireland's own obligations before the international community. All right, let's move on to the case. Now, as you know, Transparency International turned 25 this year. What is TI? TI is a very famous organization that fights corruption around the entire world. And to commemorate their 25th anniversary, they released a list of what they believe are the 25 most iconic corruption cases. And what we're doing is we're doing a rundown of each case and giving you our take on them. Today, we have the case of Ukraine and Viktor Yanukovych. Now, Viktor Yanukovych is Ukraine's former president. And he is infamous for having having committed graft with, along with his friends and close uh, people close to him, that graft that amounts to $40 billion. Billion, billion. Okay. What happened in Ukraine is in 2014, um, Yanukovych was deposed from the presidency among uh, amongst violent riots and several citizen demonstrations that ended with the death of roughly over 100 people. Horrible situation. 
These people were demanding that Yanukovych be removed from the presidency. And they did so because his, um, his acts of graft were so egregious and so severe in consequences that it, they pretty much bankrupted, bankrupted the country. And for those of you in the know, it is very, very hard to bankrupt a country because they, internationally, there is this principle of international cooperation and good faith where countries help each other achieve their goals. So it's very, very hard to, corrupt, to, to bankrupt a country and especially to do so uh, by means of corruption. Two examples that come to mind are Ukraine and, of course, Venezuela under the regime of Maduro. Previously Chavez, but now Maduro. Now, here, um, Yanukovych's crimes were so severe that, again, he it is documented that by using um, shell companies uh, incorporated in several different countries, he was he and his, and his close uh, and people close to him, his inner circle, were able to graft forty billion from people uh, from people of the Ukrainian government. His actions were so so bad that even after he fled to Russia where, by the way, he still is at large and nobody knows where he is. The courts in Ukraine decided to do something that they very rarely do. They tried him in absentia. And trying a trial in absentia means that we will hold the trial even if the, the, the person accused is not present. Okay? Uh, and again, this is something that the countries very rarely do because it can be construed as a violation of human rights. But it seems that in, in cases of uh, egregious conduct, by despots and dictators, it happens more often than it should. And Yanukovych's crime, crimes were found to be so bad that Ukraine tried him not only for graft, but for high treason. High treason, for those of you who don't know, is committing a crime that is so severe that the main, the main victim is considered to be the country, the government. So sedition, espionage, things like that. Now, his graft, his theft of people's money was so bad that he was tried and found guilty of treason and obviously convicted, but he's not serving his time. Now, Ukraine did this not just to send a message. Yes, the, the social message that uh, trying someone in absentia sends is very important, but they also did this so that they could begin proceedings to recover the assets that Yanukovych stole. From where? From foreign banks that held accounts under the name of Yanukovych and his close circle. So far, of the 40 billion that uh, Yanukovych allegedly stole, very more than likely stole, uh, the Ukrainian government has recovered only about 1.4 billion, which is fairly sad. Okay, let's move on to the typology. Today we get to talk about BEPS, base erosion and profit shifting. And so it all sounds very geeky, but we will tear it apart and we will try to explain it clearly. Okay. As we mentioned before, the OECD is a think tank, an international think tank made up of countries. And they have come up with what they, what they call BEPS. Every person, every business that makes money has to be taxed. They have to pay taxes and that's life. When uh, you pay taxes on many things, but essentially one of the most important taxes that we pay is taxes on profit. If we make a profit, if we earn money, then you have to pay a part of that to the government. Great. How do you calculate that? Well, you calcul calculate the base for taxing, the tax base. And that is not all of the money that you make, but all of the profits that you make. After you've paid your costs and your you know, uh, salaries and all of that, you calculate an amount that is essentially the profits that you make. And off that, that is your base. And off that amount, the government takes a piece. Okay, different governments collect taxes for different percentages of that base. And base erosion simply consists of employing tricks to reduce the amount on which government calculates your tax. So if uh, I made a profit of say $100, then I use accounting trickery and magic to declare that I only made say $30 and then the government can only tax me on, that, on those $30. This, again, is highly illegal and is done in, in many industries, but it's, it's fairly wrong. Now, what is that base erosion? What is profit shifting? Profit shifting is, again, you make money off of your business. That is, those are your profits. But profit shifting employs what we know, what we call uh, transfer pricing. 
Transfer pricing is money that a division in one company charges another division of the same company to use services that they provide each other. And this makes sense because sometimes one division of one country, uh, of, of one company or one organization has to give services or technology or uh, products to another division. And it doesn't make sense that they don't charge for those services. But what they do is, what sometimes companies, companies do is they inflate the prices that they charge for those services so that they can reduce the taxable basis, the taxable base. So essentially erode the taxable base. The short version of it is you charge yourself money for services and that way you spend that money and that money does not count as profits. So you don't pay taxes on that money. Okay, now why is this relevant? <clears throat> because companies do this, again, to defraud the government and they have been using um, th this model for many years and in many places, but one of the places where they use it the most is Ireland, which again has been found to be uh, a tax haven of sorts. Several famous companies, uh, among which are Apple, most notably Apple, they uh, decide to incorporate, to legally incorporate and have their legal address in Ireland and the Irish government taxes them. Yeah, they, they collect a fee, a relatively small fee that helps them in the short term, but that helps the being incorporated in Ireland helps these companies reduce taxes. And essentially what they do is say, for example, Apple in California charges Apple in Ireland some money for using services that Apple California provided Apple Ireland. So subsidiaries of the same organization, Apple Ireland then pays that money to Apple California. So it has fewer profits and those profits are then taxed on their more lax tax laws. So for example, income taxes in Ireland are around 12.5% of the gross income of a company where uh, in comparison to that in the US where they charge around 35% of income tax. So it's more than it's less than half uh, and that less than half of the money that they would have to pay in the US. And that amount is reduced, reduced even further because they erode the base. Now, why is this a typology? Because it sounds, it sounds very complex and it is, it, it gets kind of boring really, really fast. It's very important that we understand it because large companies often have subsidiaries uh, incorporated in several countries and it is profitable for them to use this accounting trickery to shift their profits, profit shifting, to shift those, the, their profits to a country that charges less or fewer taxes. And that's a problem because they are essentially defrauding their countries uh, and the governments of their countries from collecting taxes. Those, those, that is money that that government is not earning and this company is shifting to another country so that they can keep it in their pockets. Okay, so again, thank you for joining us. This was the, the Wife of Caesar. My name is Michelle Bien or Michelle Bien, either is fine. And I will leave you with this. Please uh, raise your voice and every act of corruption should be denounced. So blow the whistle, but do so safely. If you're not sure whether or not what you're looking at is corruption or you're not sure that you're entirely safe, don't do anything, refrain from acting and reach out to someone who might help you. Feel free to reach out to us at info at striner.mx or lo log on to striner.mx and find at the very bottom of the page clear instructions on how to blow the whistle through the dark web so completely anonymously and safely. But above all, please stay safe. This has been The Wife of Caesar and thank you for joining us. Have a happy Monday.